We can't do that. Hello! Welcome to Bald and Board Games. I'm Bald. I'm Bored. And today we're going to do a how-to video on D6 by Certifiable Studios. Yeah, so the objective of D6, pretty straightforward. We'll give you a full glance at all the pieces here. Yeah. Uh, as you can see here, the design of the board is similar to D6. Or similar to D6. That's really it is D6. <laughs> similar to D&D. &D. <laughs> Uh, similar to D&D, similar to Monster Hunter and other equivalent games, there's going to be a variety of sectors and regions across the board. You're going to go from one to the other. You're going to hunt some monsters. You're going to be able to collect gold and a bunch of other things. And at the end, as you earn glory points for collecting certain bounties, the player with the most glory points after six rounds, as this dial will spin through, will be deemed the victor. Absolutely. And uh, during the game, like I said, you're going to be collecting bounties. You're going to be, uh, this dial will continue on each round. In between the rounds, there's actually individual story moments. And that is in this book here. You will roll two dice. Uh, where is that? You have one that is the die that has the uh, tens on it. And then you have a ten sided die. You roll those. So we got a 70 and a one. So then you would find entry 71 in this book. And you would read what that is. But before all that, we have to set up our play area. So everybody will start off with a heroic quest card and an advantage card. You'll also choose a character that you want to use. These characters are double-sided. You have your character side and then your chib side. And we'll explain what this secondary side comes, uh, when it comes into play. So you have your character and then you have to roll for stats. I'm going to show them the board here for the stats. Perfect. So on your board, you have your three health tokens and you have your stats here, which start off as uh, blank areas. So what you do is you choose a stat, you roll your D6, which I roll on screen. Nope, not on screen anymore. There we go, on screen. <laughs> Off screen again. That's okay, we can cut this out. So down here you have your stats. And so the way that you assign your stats is by rolling a D6 and then grabbing a cube from the pile of cubes and placing it into the stat for uh, that roll. So here for strength, I rolled a five. And so I placed the five there and your stat score will give you uh, better abilities in that area. So for instance, this five in strength means I can hold five of the heroic quest and five of the advantage cards uh, separately. So a total of 10 cards during the game. My stealth is five. This comes into play when trying to get past the monsters in the game. Uh, where you would have to roll below that stealth value to get past them. So the higher, the better. For some of these, like my intelligence, it says plus one on the board. So here I actually rolled a five, but because it says plus one, that automatically becomes a six. So of course, if that was a three, it would become a four. Fun fact, a six cannot become a seven, as I learned in this game, though. So that if you do is roll true. a six <laughs> on the spot that says plus one, as Nick just showed his intelligence, yep. it just stays a six. Yes, I am intelligent. Uh, it does stay a six. Six it is, is your maximum. Intelligent. Uh, six is your maximum, <laughs> and three is your minimum. You cannot have a stat of one or two. Of course, you can roll a one or two. And if you ever roll a one, two, or three on the die, then you will place your three here, and then you will also get a gold for doing so. And so you just hold on to that. So I have one three, which means I have that one gold. Now, this skill stat that I have the three on is related to your skill markers up here. The three, as you can see, it says unlock one skill. So two of them will be up here in the locked position. One is down here unlocked, ready to use, which is coming to play for this area down here. And after you have yourself set up, we then have to place out monsters in the board, as well as the terrain tokens. And it works the same way. Should you tell them how the monsters are placed out there? Sure. So everything is based on a D10 for the board in terms of placement. There are 10 sectors or regions on the board. On um, the upper right-hand corner starts with the village. That is not a numbered region. That is literally like your home base. And then you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Mm -hmm. So for each of these terrains we rolled and placed them, we're going to do the same thing for a monster. So each of us would roll the die twice. We would get a number. We would then, out of this bag here, pull a monster out and place it in that region. Round nine. 
You can. And two fours. <laughs> as I was going to say, but we actually just did it. You can have two monsters and two terrains in the same area. So that just makes it a little bit more difficult to handle. Uh, but once you've set the initial two per person, so there's only two players, we have four out there. Yep. Uh, that is the base of the layout. And then things will happen as we progress into the game. And when you're laying out the terrain, so the terrain, like you said, gets laid out the same way. You roll a D10 after you chose one you want to put down, and you place it where it lands. With that being said, you can have two different types of terrain in one area, hence the forest and the dungeon here. You cannot have two of the same type. So you can't have two dungeon in one area. And in the expansion, there are more of these terrains. So you couldn't have two forests, so on and so forth. And those get spread out across the board. The only area where we won't have monsters or terrain is in this village area where your pieces start out. Now with the monsters, there are different types of monsters. There are the undead, which are red, the beasts, which are purple, the bandits are brown, the uh, poisonous ones, which are green, and the, oh man, what are rogues. these guys? The rogues, which are uh, the blue ones. And all the beasts, or all the animals, sorry, all the monsters work the same in regards to they give you a die uh, number on there. So like D8 or D6, D4, 12, yada, yada. And it'll say plus two. So that would mean whatever you roll will get plus two added to it. And then there's also a picture that's associated with one of these terrain areas. If they're in an area with that terrain, they get another addition to their plus. So a plus two becomes a plus three after the roll, so on and so forth. And... For each of the monsters, that's the basic way they function. And when fighting, if you lose, and we'll go over how to fight, most of the time you would lose one of your health. But for the green ones, which are poisonous, you actually have to turn one of your stats down one level. So a four, you would turn down to a three, and then for the rest. And if you ever only have threes on your board, at that point, you would lose health. But there are two other types of monsters that can come out that are much more rare. And that, these are these white ones here. And uh, the white ones, so we have the Kraken, there's dragons as well. So typically when you defeat a monster, you would get the perk on the back, you would collect the hide and put it down on your board. For things like the dragon and the Kraken, you get to take that, but it ends up being glory points at the end. For the plants, they function a little bit differently in regards to their strength. So it starts off as three, they don't actually roll a die, but for each of these plants on the board, they get an additional strength. And when you beat these, you simply get the two coins and it goes back in the bag. Well, that's the basic setup. So now I think we're gonna go into what you do on your turn and how those flow. Yeah, so first off, uh, when you start a turn, as you see, there's this dial here, as we've called out, uh, you'll have six turns. Uh, you can play a shortened game and only play three turns. Mm -hmm. uh, you have your turn. You move the dial. Then there's a double zero in between. That's the storybook Nick brought up where you'd roll that D100 and the D10 to see what story. Uh, and that is a wide variety of things can happen. Uh, <laughs> yeah. If you're interested, check out our video of the playthrough. You'll see some crazy oh, things goodness. happen. It literally changed the end of the game. 100% it did. Yeah. Uh, and then you move on. And then there's also Hunter Moons, uh, mm -hmm. which just means during that turn, monsters have an increased strength of plus two on their die roll. Yeah, much more difficult. But let's say we're entering turn one. Uh, and let's just say, hypothetically, I was the first player. We would start out with an initial piece of the puzzle, uh, which is spawning new monsters and doing an open harvest. Mm -hmm. So, Nick, you want to roll a yeah. D4 and a D10? Yeah, so you roll a D10 for the spawning of monsters and a D4 for your open gathering. <laughs> yes. Oh, there we go. So the way three. this would work is he rolled a three on the D10. That means a random monster would come out and go into the three section. Yep. The two goes directly to your game board. So you have this little gather board off to the right of your player board. You would find uh, what number two is. As you can see here, each gather board is different. So mine says wild, two coins advantage. Nick has... Mine says for number one, two coins, then two is advantage card, then three is wild. So everyone four is alchemy, but the top three do vary. Yep. Uh, so when you pick, obviously it's not gonna matter, like the odds of rolling each of the numbers is the same, <laughs> uh, but just to know like, oh, he rolled a two, oh, he gets two coins. Like, nope, that's just yours that gets two coins. His might be something different. 
Uh, so the two there for me, I would get two coins to start off the round. And I get an advantage card, so I get an additional one of those. And this here happens every player turn and it impacts everybody. So yeah. just because it's my turn or his turn, it still impacts everybody. So that's the initial part of the turn. Now on your player board, it gives you all of these options and you can do them in any order in which you want. You have three official actions that you can take unless a card tells you otherwise or you use a certain skill. And the options are kind of broken into a few categories. So number one is boosting your character. So while you're in the village, you can pay gold as one of your actions to actually raise some stats, to unlock some skills, as well as regain any health. So you can make your character more powerful. But that's a free action. That is, yes. Yeah. You said that as one of your actions. Oh, sorry. I was just clarifying yes. that's a free action. That, that is way, a free action, action. Unless, or the gold cost. Yeah. Uh, so you're not spending one of your official actions on that, uh, but it is something you can do on your turn. So you do have a grouping of free actions. So those are a few of the free actions. Uh, you also have the free action to just go in, use one of the potions that you have on your player board as well. Uh, you can buy advantage cards. So we have a little chest over here or wagon or whatever uh, of advantage cards. You can spend two gold and buy that. And you can go through and actually enemies so for example if I was just entering this section I could just fight the enemies I don't have to pay an action to do that off of my board mm -hmm. but I'm actually in the village so let's go through what the actual actions are and those are three things number one movement so I can spend an action to move you can do it one action is one move unless you want to pay gold then you can pay one gold for to add on an act, extra action or extra movement Wow, that was weird to say. <laughs> Extra movement. Now, the second thing you can do is gather. This is where you roll a d4, mm -hmm. but instead of, I got a two. Instead of everybody getting to do that alchemy board here, only you get to do it during your turn if you use that gather action. Yep. The third and final one is the one that makes the game significantly more interesting, mm -hmm. which is hunting an enemy. So if you wanted to, you can say, okay, I'm sitting here in Sweet Harbor. I want to hunt an enemy. What you would do is you use your action. You would just grab a tile out of the bag, place it down. And now you can decide to hunt that enemy and get the two gold and their hide. Or you can decide to leave it alone. And then potentially your opponent would have to cross through that area and also have to hunt them. Yep. Uh, that can come in handy if you pull a dragon and you don't have any cards to handle a d20 <laughs> dragon, your opponent might have to deal with that. Oh. Uh, so that is your turn. Uh, you would go through again. You could do the actions whatever order you want. So at the end of your turn, when you've decided you can do all the actions that you can, you're no longer uh, able to do anything else or move. As long as your health is not at zero and you've utilized your actions, you can pull heroic quest cards. You get two of them automatically. That is the official end of your turn. You then keep the heroic quest and advantage cards with you. Your tone, uh, tone, opponent begins their <laughs> turn, and you progress throughout the round. Yep. Uh, so, so something that you can also do that's a free action, your, your skills you have over here, you can also use as a free action. They allow you to do a variety of things from moving to swapping places with a hero uh, to manipulating your hunt or to adding on uh, bonuses to when you fight. But the cool thing about that is each there's four character boards in the base yeah. game. Each one is actually different. So hero swap and animal handling, uh, which deals with hunting and then swapping out here, are the same on everyone. Yep. The top three are actually different. Yep. So you can play the way Nick and I play, which is just randomly divvy out boards and you just get what you get. Or you can strategically <laughs> look through and based on your strategy style, pick yep. one that matches. You can also, each of these uh, character cards in the book, they have a class associated. So you can also divvy up all these cards by class. And then based on which character you choose, you can make sure you're using the board that matches yeah. that class. Now, before we get into how to fight these monsters, I'm gonna quickly go over everything that you can do in regards to using your gold while you're on the board. So Steve covered everything you could do in the village with training, resting and upgrading your skills. Um, did you mention the, the training yard? And they're rolling to upgrade? I did not. Let's start here. So uh, in the village, you can spend two gold to increase one of your stats by one. 
or you can go for more of a luck based uh, roll to where you would spend one gold, you would roll a d6 and upgrade your skill based on what you rolled, which happened to be a six, which I never rolled the entire time we played. Only in this tutorial. Oh my <laughs> goodness gracious. So if you had a three, that three would immediately become a six. So it can be worth paying the one gold and getting that and it'd be cheaper as well. Being in the village automatically heals all your health. And then you can pay one gold to uh, refresh one of your skills that was used previously. That's unlocked. Outside in the field or in the village as well, there are some other things you can do here. So you can spend two gold at any point in time to on your turn to buy an advantage card. And remember, you can only ever hold the number of advantage cards in your hand equal to what it says in your strength stat area. After rolling a die during a battle or skill check of some kind or anything really, you can spend two gold to buy Dogma, which allows you to reroll that die. If you're fighting one of the undead, you can spend two gold before you start the fight to buy Holy Water, which is gonna change your base die from a D6 into a d12 and steve will explain how the dice work in regards to battling in a moment when you're moving it costs one action to move but then you can pay gold one gold per extra movement that you want to do so if you want to move two spaces you would spend one extra gold to move an additional space if you want to move three you spend two extra gold to move two additional spaces over your normal one everybody then can, if you can go on my board here everybody has a little cash cube guy down here it says d12 on it and these guys are there to disrupt the other players you can spend two gold to dispatch them anywhere on the board and those are all the additional actions that you can do in the village or on the board any point in time so how do we actually get these monster hides yeah so the monster hides again are all of the non-white monsters <laughs> <laughs> So the dragons, which are white, as well as the uh, Garden of Eden or something like that. Not the Bible. Uh, oh, uh, something the of Eden. Flowers of Eden? Oh, the plants, plants of Eden. Eden. Plants of Eden. The plants of Eden. Plants of Eden. Uh, those just give you gold or glory points. Yep. All of the rest of these give you gold and you get to gather their hide. So on your player board, or the gather board actually, yep. you can gather three specific hides on the right side in red, two wild hides on the left. Once you gather all three hides on the right, you're actually able to change any monster on the map from whatever they say to a base D6. So for example, if the Kraken <laughs> was here in the Father's Den, and so was I, I'm like, oh no, I can't beat a D20 probably. So I'm gonna automatically change it to a D6 by redeeming three of those hides. So in order to fight, you do a few steps. Step one is you enter an area with a monster or you utilize some type of skill or alchemy potion to bring a monster to you. Once you've done that, like I have right here, I have a bandit, you identify what die they have. So in this case, they're gonna be assigned a D4. They also get a boost plus one, just in general. They may get a boost based on terrain. And then if you're in the two hunter moon phases on the game board, they would get another boost of two. Before you as the offensive player that decided to battle goes into the battle, mm -hmm. the other player, and there could be multiple, uh, if you're playing with multiple players, can buff, yep. which means they can add boost to that monster. So if that happens, oh, and he didn't even <laughs> buff, he just made it way worse. Uh, <laughs> so if you were to buff, you would just add these little tokens, but Nick was able to have a OP card. So this card says player can't use advantage cards. And the way that you can distinguish the heroic quest cards that you can use to buff a monster or affect another player during their turn is up here, it'll be red instead of green. Red means that you can play it to affect the other player. Green means it's there to affect you. But yeah, the one that this I played here means that he wouldn't be able to play any advantage cards. Yeah, so for example, I have an advantage card that says add four to any combat roll, which would be great when battling a monster. I wouldn't be able to use it. The cool thing about the heroic quest cards, if you are the person attacking, is most quest cards only count for the first attack. So as I'm engaged in battle, I would fight this little monster. 
if I lose, I would lose a health, and then I would have to battle again. Once we've officially finished that first battle, unless there is a buff on the monster, which is these little symbols here, which, yeah, right there is a perfect example, place a buff on a monster. These stay out for the duration, but the card that Nick just played, no advantage, that would be now gone. Mm -hmm. And then I could play advantage cards on my second attempt. So the last piece of the puzzle is myself as the person attacking, how do I do things? For the advantage cards, if I was able to play any, some of them, like Nick is going to show here, mm -hmm. have the ability to change what die you're using. Normally, you start out with a D6, but the cards may tell you different. <laughs> well, so these two cards, so the one I have here, uh, the Lip Biter's Blade, still says D6, but there's an effect underneath it that says if the monster's combat roll is over a 6, you just win the fight. So this would be a great one to play against something like the Kraken that's rolling a D20, because the likelihood they're going to roll over a 6 is great. Sometimes it changes your die to go lower. So the Nunya Chucks <laughs> makes your D6 a D4, but it has the critical status on the bottom. Critical means whatever you roll on the die is multiplied by two. So these D numbers on all of these cards will go all the way up from D4 all the way to the D12, potentially the D20 as well. There are uh, many effects on the bottom of these cards. The main ones that you should know are critical, which doubles your value that you roll. Ranged, which means if you lose, you won't take damage. Dual wield, which means when you play a weapon down, you can subsequently play another one. Typically, you can only play one weapon at a time. So that means you're only ever rolling, for the most part, unless the card states otherwise, rolling one die that it specifies on the card, or like Steve said, your base D6. Now there are some other ways to increase your strength during a battle. And I think Steve has some of those cards. Yes, uh, so there's a few different heroic quests. There's advantage cards, uh, but first you're not gonna use those cards until you've actually battled. Mm -hmm. So in this case, this monster would be rolled by the opponent with a D4, I would roll my D6. So let's just say I got a one on my D6. He got a three. So based on the addition, he has a four plus the buff is a five. I have a few options now. I can just take the loss and take a health or subtract a health. I can use two gold if I have it, which I do for dog mud, which would mean re-roll my die and hopefully that would pan out. And hey, my six would win. I could spend two gold to get an advantage card which now gives me an additional benefit, uh, potentially for the current turn, potentially for a future turn, or I can use any other card I currently hold. Uh, so for some of these, they can be used during the turn, somewhere before the actual battle takes place. Uh, so for example, I have this, which says plus four to any combat roll. So my one would become a five. This was a three plus four plus one is also five, but... The cool thing here is I have a strength of six. My strength says with six, I get to win all ties. So what would happen then? I take the tie, the little buff comes off the board, all of the cards played by either side are discarded, and then this little hide comes to me, I get two gold for successfully conquering, and I would play it down into my gather board. The cool thing about that as well is that is not actually a spended action. Because mm -hmm. I was in that space to start, that triggers automatically, but I didn't have to pay for it. So now I can attempt to move elsewhere and engage in other battles, or I can try to move somewhere where there is no monsters and potentially do something over there. And a good thing to note, like Steve just moved into this area here with monsters. If you ever move into an area with monsters, you are immediately engaged. You can play cards right there if you have some heroic quest cards that could potentially push monsters out of the way or somehow let, get you by uh, but if not you are engaged with the monster or monsters in that area now the engagement starts with the strongest monster which you have to fight before you go to the weaker one now certain monsters 
uh, can't be avoided, but most you can try to stealth by. And that is where your stealth check would come into play. You would roll your base D6, and if you roll below your stealth value, you would successfully sneak past whichever monster you're engaged with first. Now, if there's multiple, you have to get past both of them. So say I got past the first one, tried again, and failed, I would then be engaged with this monster in a battle. So why kill monsters just for hides? And how do you end up ultimately winning the game? You need to collect these bounties. These bounties have victory points in the bottom right corner. And this is what you're really trying to do throughout the game is collect these bounties. To collect a bounty, you have to be in the proper space. So for instance, this bandits one says North Point, which is up here at this corner of the board. And you need to kill a monster of the matching type there. So we would need a bandit in that space, which we can never draw. It's hilarious. There we go. So this bandit was in this space to begin with, and I moved in and killed it. Then I would take the bandit, I would get the hide and the two oh, gold. That's where the bandit went. Oh, yeah, over there. <laughs> <laughs> I think we definitely put a bandit out. <laughs> I get the hide and the two gold, and I would also take this bounty card and I would place it in my pack. Now your pack can only ever hold three bounty cards at one time. If you ever have three, you cannot collect any more. So what you need to do to get rid of these is you need to take your bounties to the village. When you get to the village, you offload your pack. You keep the card because there's gonna be a point at the end of the game, but now you're free to get more. And whenever a bounty is collected, you immediately put out a new bounty card and you would spawn a new monster like we did at the beginning of the game by rolling your d10 and putting out whatever monster that is on that space. For instance, the seven, we'll place it right there. What happens if you spawn a bounty and it lands in the same spot as the one you're currently <laughs> in? If you spawn a monster and it lands in the same spot that you're currently in, you are engaged with that monster as well. Now, if it's the end of your turn, if you've taken your last action, and the result of that last action was you collecting a bounty and then one being spawned in that spot, your turn can end, but at the start of your next turn, you are immediately engaged with that monster. And you cannot stealth away from monsters that you're immediately engaged with at the beginning of your turn. Only ones in which, where you move into a space, can you? Now, there are ways to pull monsters to you. There is a potion that's called Pharaoh Monsters, and we're not gonna go through every potion, uh, but that's one you really want to know, where if you are in North Point, and we'll say this bandit was in the past, and you're like, okay, I need that guy over here with me. If you have the Pharaoh Monsters potion, it allows you to lure a monster into your space from any other location. Secondly, if there is no bandit on the board, but you want to go for it and take a chance and hopefully find one, that's where you can take the hunt action that Steve mentioned earlier, where you pull a monster from the bag, but instead of rolling to put on the board, you would just place it on your space. And now a monster placed in your space in this fashion in regards to hunting is different than if you were to spawn one there normally or walk into a space. If you imagine the hunting action for what it says, hunting, you are creeping up on the monster in this space and discovering it. So it hasn't noticed you. So when you hunt a monster and put it in that space, you can choose whether you want to engage with it or not. Yep, and the last way to attack a monster is that let's say the monster is over here in the bay, mm. and boom, uh, this one is required. You have a skill listed on your board, and every player has this called Hero Swap. Mm -hmm. So as long as you're not currently engaged in battle, it would normally take purple here six turns of movement to get all the way over into the bay. But if you have the skill available on your board here for hero swap and a skill marker, you can activate that, switch the players, you would now move here and automatically be engaged in that battle. Obviously, you hope to have the cards necessary to defeat the monster, but then you are in prime position to now take that bandits card from the bay and get a bounty for yourself. And Hero Swap's a fun action as well. It's very uh, dynamic. So if it was the same situation, but in reverse here. So uh, my guy's up here in North Point. I want to get to the bay to collect that bounty. But 
I'm starting my turn engaged with a monster. I can't stealth away from that monster, so I have to fight it for one turn. But if I lose, instead of taking uh, damage, I can immediately use my hero swap ability to say, nope, I'm escaping and doing that action, which would then of course engage you with this monster in the bay, uh, which I would want to kind of go after that bounty. And that's what you're trying to do throughout the game is you're trying to get in the best position to get these monsters to collect these bounties that are going to be coming out each turn and uh, collecting the most glory points. And the monsters will never run out on the board because the monster will go out every time you collect a bounty. The beginning of each turn, you do what Steve showed earlier. You have your spawn roll and your open gather roll and it just kind of cycles through uh, three or six rounds. And at the end, you're the tally of who wins. Yeah. Yeah. So once the sixth round is complete, any bounty cards you have, plus any potential white cards you have that have a little glory point symbol on them, mm -hmm. uh, which would be the Kraken as well as any of the dragons, highest total wins. If you happen to be tied, which a lot of the times Nick and I are, uh, <laughs> then there's some tiebreakers. I believe one of them is Count of Gold that yep. you have left over, as well as there's a few others that the game book would tell you. And like all of our how-to videos we do with these games, these are not meant to be uh, watched alone to learn the full ins and outs of the game. These are meant to help you learn after you've read the rule book or in a company you read the rule book. So definitely go through and read your rule books, especially this one. It is so nice, this hardcover book, paying homage to the, the original D&D &D book that they had. So read this, watch this, and hopefully we've answered any questions that you may have had that may have been a little bit confusing. Yeah, I would say for this book specifically, uh, the page numbers are colored. So there's different colors for different types, the sections throughout the book. Uh, I recommend, I believe it's the blue. Don't read the blue section. Oh, the purple. Ah, there we go. Yeah. Don't read the purple section. That is the hundred possible outcomes you have from the mid-turn quest rolls. Uh, but read everything else. Uh, but I would say you definitely want to be surprised by what's going to happen in the mid-rounds. Uh, everyone who's playing, there's again, there's a hundred different things that could happen. Yeah. Some positive, some negative, some crazy. Uh, some you roll a die by chance and that tells you what happens. Yeah. Others, it just says, hey, get two gold or whatever it may be. Yeah. Uh, but I would say don't read that. Just save that for the actual gameplay, but read everything else. So yep. it give you a nice overview on all the bits and pieces. Yeah, go through the setup, go through the main rules, and then dive right in. And if something seems confusing, come here, <laughs> watch our video again. Uh, I'm sure we've gone confused. over it at some point in time. <laughs> God, hopefully we're not more confused, my goodness gracious. Well, thank you for watching this How to Play D6 by Certifiable Studios. This was Bald and Board Games. I'm Bald. I'm Bored. And we'll catch you next time.